Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for letting me be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. My goal is to help you to study and teach the scriptures with more relevancy and power. This week, we're going to be finishing the book of Jacob by covering chapters 5 through 7. And remember, teachers, if you're interested in getting access to the materials that I put together for teachers to help reduce your preparation time, increase your confidence in the classroom, and help to create edifying classroom experiences, just go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to all of those resources. Now, if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. For Jacob, chapters 5 and 6, I almost always like to begin this lesson as an object lesson. I bring in a shovel, a watering can, pruners, a bag of fertilizer, some work gloves, a canning jar, and a box of matches. And I tell them that today we're going to learn about growing fruit trees. And for an icebreaker, I display those objects and I ask, how could each of these objects help in growing fruit from fruit trees? And there's, there's many possible answers to that, but it's usually a pretty good discussion. Uh, the shovel could be used to plant, to loosen the soil. And the watering can, of course, allows the gardener to water the tree. Pruners could be used to cut off dead branches or to prune back live branches to strengthen the rest of the tree. Fertilizer provides the tree with nourishment that it needs to grow. Work gloves allow the gardener's hands to be protected so that he can work really, really hard. A canning jar could be used to preserve fruit that the tree has grown. And matches? Well, perhaps you could use matches to burn dead branches. There's many possible responses to our icebreaker question. Well, there is a very famous chapter in the Book of Mormon about growing fruit trees. And actually, this chapter wasn't written by Jacob himself. He's quoting an Old Testament prophet by the name of Zenos, whose writings aren't available to us anymore. But Jacob had access to those writings on the brass plates. And thankfully, he's passing that story, that prophecy, on to us here at Jacob. And the Lord's intended purpose for this chapter is not, not to make us better gardeners. He has a much higher objective than that. Chapter is Jacob chapter 5. And the first thing you're going to notice about Jacob 5 is its length. It's really long. If you're the type of person that likes to read a chapter a night, Jacob 5 is probably going to be a bit of a challenge for you. It's the longest chapter in the Book of Mormon. It's often referred to as the allegory of the tame and wild olive trees. And it revolves around the imagery of a vineyard owner who's trying to bring forth good fruit from his trees. What's an allegory? The manual tells us that allegories are stories that teach spiritual truths through symbols. But to be more specific, an allegory is a type of metaphor where everything in the story represents a particular idea or real-world event. Allegories are full of parallels to actual events, and that's the case here. Each part of the story represents a group of people or an event in the world's spiritual history. Jacob Vibe recounts the spiritual history of the house of Israel from its earliest days all the way down to the millennium. You have the tame olive tree, which represents the house of Israel, and the wild olive tree that represents the Gentiles. And as you read, you're going to see many, many different events depicted. If you know what you're looking for, you're going to be able to point out events like the scattering of Israel, the establishing of the Nephites and the Lamanites in the New World, the Great Apostasy, the gathering of Israel in the last days, and the millennium. And if you read it that way, you're going to learn a lot. It will certainly be a fruitful study for you, pun intended. But in this video, I'm going to approach Jacob 5 a little differently. There's so much that has been said and written about this chapter as an allegory 
that I feel I don't really have much to add. There's plenty of resources out there for you to use that approach, and and I encourage you to use them. Uh, In the Come Follow Me manual, for example, you're going to find an excellent graphic depicting the breakdown of the chapter into the different periods of the world's history and some of the interpretation of the allegory. But here, I prefer to teach Jacob chapter 5 as a parable. A parable is a bit different from an allegory. Its purpose isn't so much to represent actual groups or events, but general principles and truths about life. And when I read it that way, I seem to gain a much more personal meaning from the chapter. But that being said, whether you read it as an allegory or a parable, one's not better than the other. They're just different focuses. In my approach, we're going to look for principles that Jacob 5, and a little from Jacob 6 too, since it represents Jacob's commentary on Zenos' prophecy, what they teach us about God and the different ways in which he works in our lives. And actually, I can't think of many other places in the scriptures where I feel I get a better understanding of the character and the heart of God and the way he works with us, his children than Jacob chapter 5. Want to get to know God as a gardener? This chapter is going to teach you. So let's call the principles that we find here truths from the vineyard. And I would like to focus on seven. As a Sunday school teacher, you'll probably have to pick and choose which of these principles you feel are the most important because you're not going to have time to do all of them in one lesson. You'll just frustrate yourself. (laughs) Follow the Spirit and consider the needs of your class and pick the truths that you feel most inspired to share. For those of you that have uh, subscriptions uh, where you use my PowerPoint slides, remember, you feel free to edit and cut and delete and add anything you want to those presentations so that it fits how you want to cover the lesson. But regardless of which principles you choose, I would make sure that you start with this activity. The first step to understanding any parable is to list the different elements within it and ponder their interpretation. What do each of those elements symbolize? Then the parable will really open up to you and you can start to see the truths that it has to teach you. Here are some of the elements that I see in Jacob 5 and some possible interpretations. The vineyard is the world, or mortality. The master of the vineyard we can see as God, or Jesus Christ. Both of those work. The servant would be Jesus Christ, if you see God as the master of the vineyard, or prophets. The olive trees are people, or are you, yourself. The labor in the vineyard is how God works with us. Good fruit, righteousness and blessings. Bad fruit or decay, wickedness and consequences. And the soil, the circumstances under which we are born or raised. Okay, now that we've established that background, let's see what truths we can discover about our Heavenly Father and His work. The first truth the goal of the gardener. What does the master hope to accomplish with his vineyard, with us? Is it to get us to do what he says because he's in charge? Is it to inflict suffering and pain on us so that we know what it's like? Is it to toy with us for his own amusement? Let's see here. There's a lot of repetition in this chapter. Usually, if an idea is repeated in the scriptures, it's because the author is trying to communicate something of importance. It's a means of expressing emphasis. Find the phrase or idea that's repeated in each of the following verses that answers our question. What does the master hope to accomplish with us, with his vineyard? In verses 13, 18, 19, 20, 23, 29, 31, 33, 
46, 54, 60, 61, 71, 75, and 76. Told you, there's a lot of repetition of this idea. Were you able to pick it out? Over and over again, he tells us that he wants to lay up fruit against the season for himself. And at this point in the lesson, I would pull out the canning jar as a visual aid. In some of those verses, he says that he wishes to preserve the fruit unto himself. What does that mean symbolically? I think it means that God's goal for us is to have us return to live with him, to enjoy the fruits or the blessings of our righteousness together with him. There's also some unique messages with additional detail in verses 54, 60, and 61. In verse 54, he says that he wishes to have glory in the fruit of his vineyard. Verse 60 tells us that he works with the trees so that he can have joy in the fruit of the vineyard, to rejoice exceedingly with them. And in verse 61, he uses the word precious to describe the fruit. What does all of that mean for you and I? If we're his trees and the fruit is our righteous works, God's major desire for us is to produce good fruit so that he can enjoy that fruit with us at some future season. I assume he means the season when the growing period is over and no more work can be done. When the judgment arrives and the rest of eternity begins. His ultimate goal is to preserve us and to bring us to where he is. Everything the master of the vineyard does for the trees is to that end. It's the purpose of his work and the cause of his glory. It reminds me of Moses chapter 1 verse 39, where God says, For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. The ideas of work and glory fit really well with what we're reading here in Jacob chapter 5. God is working incredibly hard to help his trees produce the kind of fruit that will lead them to eternal life. Our first truth then, God's goal is our good works and glory. It's really important that we understand that right from the outset, because some of the methods that he's going to use to produce good fruit can sometimes be a little hard to comprehend, maybe even hard to accept. That's going to lead us to our second truth. What is the master willing to do to help us, as his trees, produce good fruit? There's one key word that stands out to me as the definitive answer to that question, and then a whole list of other words that are associated with it. But see if you can find our first overall key word. It's repeated in the following verses, 15, 16, 32, 61, 62, 71, 72, 74, and 75. The word is labor. And at that point, I would pull out the work gloves. God works in our lives in your life. For many centuries, God was depicted as either a detached, a vengeful, or an impersonal God. Jacob 5 proves otherwise. He's not indifferent. He's laboring to help us. In verse 32, he says, all our labor. He puts all of his efforts into turning us into gods. He's a loving parent working to help his children reach their full potential, to receive a fullness of joy and a fullness of glory. Jacob 5 proves to us that God is a personal God. And however this functions, he's working just as hard to do that in your life as he is in mine. And not only does he work with us, but look at how he works with us. In verse 61, 
he labors diligently with his might. And in verse 74, we find that he labors with all diligence. We, as his trees, are not just some side project or a hobby. We're all of his work and his glory. So truth number two, God labors diligently for our welfare and our growth. What are some of the methods that he uses to work with us? How does he labor? There's a number of different verbs that show up over and over and over again in this chapter. In fact, a great marking activity would be to go through and mark every time you see one of these words show up. First, let's see if you can find them. And I'm going to give you the first letter to help you out. If you want a little more of a challenge, don't look at the first letter and see if you can find the repeated word without any help. And I'll make both options available to you as teachers as a handout. Uh, here they are, and all of the verses that you'll find them in. Uh, I'm not going to recite all of the verses here. Uh, you just can look at the handout or the visual there. But here are the words. You've got nourish, dig, graft, prune, dung, and burn, or cast into the fire. And here's what that would look like if you marked each of these words all throughout Jacob chapter 5. All right, now, now that's quite the list, isn't it? And what does that tell us about how our Heavenly Father labors for us? Overall, God uses many different methods to help us to produce good fruit. And the fun part here is, is what do each of these methods look like in real life? How does God nourish us, prune us, or graft us? And in a class, I wouldn't pigeonhole any of my students into one particular interpretation of those terms. There's more than one way of looking at them. I'm going to give you some suggested ways here, but if you're teaching, just go with the flow of your students' thoughts. Let them discover, ponder, and share. This, to me, is one of the most fruitful discussions that you can have in Jacob chapter 5. And then, as you're discussing, you can add your own insights as well as the teacher. For each word, I want you to keep two types of questions in mind. A like in the scriptures question and a taking it to heart question. The like in the scriptures question would be, well, how does God do that thing for us? And then after you've discussed that symbolism for a while, you could ask, how has God done that for you? be a good follow-up question to a student's comments. And as I, I teach those different words, I'd pull out the different tools that a gardener might use. So first, the watering can. Nourish. How does God nourish us? Nourishing a tree is to give it the elements that it needs to grow and to grow well. God has sent us nourishment in many different ways to help us to grow spiritually. What is the nourishment? We can go to Jacob chapter 6 for a little bit of help on that one. Remember that it's Jacob's commentary on what he's just quoted from Zenos in chapter 5. What are we nourished by? The good word of God all the day long. So God nourishes us with the scriptures the words of the living prophets, patriarchal blessings, the promptings of the Holy Ghost. All the day long, he's offering us that nourishment. A good word that's associated with nourishment would be feasting. We've got to feast in order to be nourished. Like Nephi said in 2 Nephi 32, feast upon the words of Christ. For behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what ye should do. So let the Lord 
nourish you? And how has the Lord nourished you? What evidence of that do you see in your life? Dig. How does God dig us? And here I pull out my shovel. In my mind, the digging about the trees represents all the things that God provides us that allows the nourishment to go to our roots. There are many tools or instruments in his hands that he sends to break up the soil of our hearts to allow the goodness of God, to allow that that nourishment to get to our roots. So, who are some of the shovels of our lives? To me, the prophets, parents, bishops, youth leaders, teachers, good friends, grandparents, mission presidents, many, many people that are sent to bless us to improve our ability to be nourished. And maybe the next time you see one of these people, you could thank them for being such a great shovel, right? But you might want to quickly explain what you mean by that, unless they think it's an insult. For me, I'm especially grateful to my father and my mother, amazing shovels who worked so hard to dig about my roots when I was just a young, tender plant by teaching me the scriptures, leading me down the gospel path, and supporting me in my challenges. God has sent a lot of shovels for you, too. So let the Lord dig about you. Graft. Have you ever been grafted? At this point, I pull out my pruners. And if you're not sure how grafting works or what that means, it really is amazing. When I first heard about this, I thought it was made up, right? And there's like no way that that is actually going to work. But what you can do is you can cut off a branch on one tree, then make a cut in a completely different tree, stick the cut branch down into that notch, wrap it up with fertilizer and soil, and then leave it. Eventually, miraculously, the branch attaches itself to the new tree and begins to be nourished by the new tree. Now, how are our lives like that? If the branch could talk, what might it say? Hey, but why are you putting me over here? This isn't my tree. This isn't where I belong. This is foreign to me. Put me back where I'm comfortable. Well, Has your life ever put you into one of those kinds of situations? Maybe it's a move to a new place, a new job. Sometimes you might be called to a specific calling in the church that it's not in your comfort zone or your area of expertise. What do you mean the primary? I don't even like kids. Uh, You can't ask me to teach gospel doctrine. I don't know enough. Bishop, you want me to serve in the young men's organization? I'm too old for that. I don't even speak their language. What language do deacons speak? We've probably all found times in our lives where we felt out of place or grafted. I'm going to give you an example of this from my life. When I was first hired as a teacher, I was assigned to teach in Arizona. And I've got to be honest with you, both my wife and I weren't is super excited about that. We were both raised in the Salt Lake area. I've got no family in Arizona. The climate isn't my favorite. (laughs) And I love, love, love living right near the mountains and all the kinds of activities that you can do in the mountains and the high mountains. So needless to say, we felt out of place. We thought that that experience was going to be short-lived, and before we knew it, we'd be back in Utah. Well, things didn't quite work out that way. Fourteen years later, we were still living in Arizona. But during that time, something miraculous happened. The Lord grafted us to a different tree, in a different climate, in a different area. Now, We have since moved back to Utah, 
We've been here for about seven years now, and we're grateful to be here. But we don't look back at our experience in Arizona as a negative thing. I love Arizona and all of the memories that we created there. My marriage was strengthened because we had to rely on each other instead of surrounding family. All of my children were born in Arizona. I learned to enjoy certain aspects of the climate. I learned how to teach there. I made amazing friendships, and I loved the strength and the goodness of the members of the church there. And although we resisted a bit at first and fought against it, we should have just trusted in the gardener. He knew what he was doing all along. My years in Arizona are a positive and a very vital and key chapter in my life and my family members' lives. Situations like that may turn up at various times in our lives. And like the master of the vineyard says in verse 18, if we had not grafted in these branches, the tree thereof would have perished. So the question is, are we willing to trust in the wisdom of the garden? Hopefully we do. So let the Lord graft you. Prune. Have you ever felt like you were pruned by the Lord? I'd ask that while still holding the pruners. Has God ever cut you back or allowed you to be cut back? Pruning involves cutting off branches that are alive and growing. There may be times when we feel like we're thriving and we're going in the right direction. And then all of a sudden, snip, and the branch is cut away. Perhaps it's a job that you love. Things are going well when all of a sudden, snip, you're laid off. Perhaps it's a relationship that you feel is moving in the right direction. And then, snip, the other person ends that relationship. Perhaps it's a calling in the church that you love, and you feel that you're flourishing in it. And then, snip, the bishop releases you. Perhaps everything is going well in your life and your health. And then out of the blue, snip, there's an accident or a diagnosis. And your whole life is completely different from that point on. Pruning is painful and it's often hard to accept. It's one of the most difficult means of labor for us to understand as mortals. And, and I'm not sure that all of the pruning is directly under the Lord's direction. I feel sometimes we're just pruned by life, by mortality. But the effect is the same. Remember why we prune a tree. It helps to direct its growth. It's actually good for the tree and allows more strength and nourishment to flow into the remaining branches. A great little church video that you could, could watch here that illustrates this principle is entitled The Will of God with D. Todd Christofferson. He relates a story that was told by a former general authority about a gardener taking care of a currant bush. Very applicable here, and I'll put a link to it in the description below. Pruning is a very important strategy for growing healthy trees. So let the Lord prune you and ponder how God has pruned you. Dung. <laughs> Have you ever felt like you've been dunged by the Lord? At this time, I'd pull out the bag of manure or fertilizer. And uh, what's dung, some of your students might ask? The polite word is fertilizer, manure. Manure. But there are plenty of other more impolite words for it. Poop, for example. But have you ever felt like life just dropped a load of dung on you? Times when everything just seems to fall apart. When everything goes wrong. When the kinds of things happen that make us turn heavenward and ask, Why? 
Why, Lord, why are you doing this to me? Being dunged is no fun. These are the unpleasant, smelly, demoralizing experiences of our lives. And if trees could talk, you might imagine how they would react to dunging. They might say, hey, what was that for? Here I am, just growing my little heart out, doing the best I can, everything's going fine, and you come over and dump that smelly stuff all over me. Why would you do that? Junior high was a dunging experience for me, as it is for many people, I know. But for me, I was short and I was uncoordinated. I had braces, I had acne, and those things didn't produce a lot of confidence in myself. And I sometimes asked, why me? Well, ask yourself, why do you put dung on plants and trees? Because it's full of minerals and other elements that help the tree to grow more healthy. It, it helps the tree to grow. And it's the same thing with us. We must face opposition in things to really become the souls that God intends us to become. Many times these dunging experiences, as unpleasant as they are, produce the greatest growth in us. When junior high ended, things got much better for me in high school. I grew up, the acne went away, I got my braces off, and everything seemed to be a whole lot better. Yet, I am forever grateful for what my junior high experience taught me. I believe it made me a kinder person. It taught me the importance of having self-confidence. It helped me to get over worrying about the judgments of others. It made me stronger. Dunging is never welcomed in the moment. It's very difficult to ignore the mess and the smell. But in the long run, when we see the growth, when we see the strength that we gain from it, the gratitude comes. Now, I've experienced many more dunging experiences in my life. I can think of experiences in my teaching, in parenthood, my mother passing away, some physical injuries and sicknesses that I've endured. But for each one of those experiences, I've, I've seen growth. The Lord has made me a stronger and a better tree in the long run. So let's let the Lord dung us. Burn. Have you ever felt like the Lord burned you? Unlike dunging and pruning, the branches the Lord burns, to me, are those things that we should never have allowed to grow in our lives in the first place. Sometimes we grow decaying branches of rebellion, addiction, laziness, casualness in our covenants, and disobedience. The master of the vineyard walks over and reminds us that those branches just can't stay. They're never going to do. They need to be cut away and cast into the fire. And that too can be a painful process. Repentance produces a godly sorrow or should produce a godly sorrow that helps to change our hearts. But remember that fire is a purifying element in the scriptures. The Holy Ghost is often referred to as the baptism of fire. It's not always a negative thing. We need to allow him to burn the pride out of us, the dishonesty, the addictions, the greed, the jealousy, the selfishness. We ought to frequently ask ourselves if there are any dead branches still on our tree that need to be cut away and burned. So, as strange as it sounds, let God burn you. Well, those are all of our laboring words. And if we want to put those all together into one truth, God will nourish, dig, graft, prune, dung, and burn to help us to grow good fruit. Another truth from the vineyard, despite all of the efforts of the master, his trees still don't always produce good fruit. So what repeated phrase do you find in each of the following verses? 
7, 11, 32, 46, 47, 51, and 66. It grieveth me that I should lose this tree. And if you look in verse 41, what does the Lord of the vineyard do? He weeps. What does that suggest about the Lord of the vineyard? How does he feel about us? He loves us. Incredibly, he is deeply, emotionally invested in us. When we don't produce good fruit, it pains him greatly. It reminds me of Enoch's vision in Moses 7 when Enoch sees both the face of Satan and the face of the Savior as they look down on the wickedness and the misery of the world, as they look down at the bad fruit, right? And Satan is laughing at their misery. But the face of the Savior is weeping. Sometimes we're a little troubled by the descriptions of the wrath of God sweeping people off the face of the earth, especially in the Old Testament. But we've got to make sure that we put the right face with those words. It's not an angry face or an indifferent face or a vindictive face. It's a face full of tears and grief. When we sin, when we stray from the path, When we don't bring forth good fruit, God grieves for us. We're precious to him, remember? And he wants more than anything else for us to be happy and to enjoy fruitfulness. I think that's one of the reasons that Zenos chose olive trees to represent us. Olive trees were among the most valuable to people in ancient times. Their fruit was used for food. The oil from the olives could be used for light, for medicine, amongst other things. They were a precious commodity to their owners. Now, that's how the master feels about you and me. Truth, God grieves when we fail to grow good fruit because we're precious to him. Another truth. What do the following phrases teach you about the master of the vineyard? Verses 41, 47, and 49. What could I have done more for my vineyard? Verse 46. I like the phrase, all the care which we have taken. Verse 47. I have stretched forth mine hand all the day long. And in verse 50, spare it a little longer. What do all of those phrases together teach us? Well, with all the problems and the decay and the bad fruit that this vineyard produces, you would imagine that a much less devoted and patient vineyard owner would have turned it into firewood long before. But this master is different. Remember, he truly loves his trees. He's invested everything into them. And something that impresses me as I study Jacob chapter 5 is the amount of care that he takes and how many chances he gives the trees of his vineyard to grow good fruit. There's a word that the scriptures often use to describe that quality that the master of the vineyard has. It's called long suffering. Have you ever heard that term before? God doesn't give up on us. He does everything that he can anything that might have a chance of working, he's willing to try. He takes all the care he can and stretches forth his hand all the day long. You remember Laman and Lemuel? Think of all the things that he tried with those two and how long he suffered with their rebellion and still continue to try and bring them to righteousness. A lot of people wonder if God will give people a second chance. They'll ask me questions like, do you think that such and such a person will have a chance to repent in the next life? Do you think he'll give so-and-so a chance to change later? Do you think that the people who reject missionaries are going to get another chance in the spirit world, or did they blow it at the doorstep? My response to all of those questions is something that C.S. Lewis once said. He said, 
I believe that if a million chances were to do any good, they would be given. Whether God offers another chance isn't the most interesting question that we can ask. The more interesting question is, will the person that's offered it take it? I believe that God is a God of second chances and third chances and 40th chances and 500th chances. Truth number five, then, God gives his trees many chances, opportunities to grow good food. All right. Now, now there's a fascinating symbol of this parable that we haven't examined yet. That's the soil. The master of the vineyard plants the trees in different kinds of soil. Now, what kind of fruit would you expect to get from trees planted in good soil? Good fruit, right? And what kind of fruit would you expect to get from trees planted in poor soil? Poor fruit, right? Well, let's see if that holds true in the Lord's vineyard. In verse 21, we find that the master had planted a tree in the poorest spot in all the land of the vineyard. The ground there is so poor that the servant questions the master's wisdom in putting them there. The Lord responds by saying, Counsel me not. I knew that it was a poor spot of ground. And then in verse 23, he points out another tree in the vineyard that was planted in even poorer soil than the first. And yet they had both produced much good fruit. On the other hand, in verse 25, we find the master and the servant observing a tree that was planted in a good spot of ground. And yet only a part of the tree is bringing forth good fruit. And then later in verse 43, we find out that the spot was not just a good spot of ground, but that it was choice above all other parts of the land of the vineyard. And at this point, none of the fruit is good. It's all corrupted. So do you see an interesting conclusion that we could make about the trees and the soil? Apparently, it doesn't matter what type of soil you're planted in. What matters is how you respond to the nourishing. I know of people out there who I would say were planted in very poor soil. Their family, socioeconomic, physical circumstances are much less than ideal, sometimes even tragic. When I consider these precious souls, I sometimes might look heavenward and ask the servant's question. Why would you plant somebody here? This is very poor soil. And the master looks back and says, Counsel me not. I knew it was a poor spot of ground. Which is nice to know if you feel like you've been planted in poor soil. God is aware of that fact. He knows you and your circumstances, and he's always going to take that into consideration as he works with you. And then he says, wherefore, I have nourished it this long time. So the master is there to nourish those that are planted in poor soil. He's not forgotten or ignored them. And I imagine that you could probably think of people that you know of who have come from very disadvantageous circumstances who have produced very good fruit. Think of some of the individuals and the families that I taught in Brazil who lived in the most humble and poor and difficult of circumstances, who were also some of the most humble and faithful and dedicated disciples of Jesus Christ that I have ever met. I know of some individuals who have disabilities, medical conditions which make their lives very difficult, very challenging, who are also some of the most optimistic and grateful people that I know. I know of people who have risen from abusive and negligent circumstances who are now thriving in the church. Poor soil, good fruit. On the other hand, perhaps you can also think of some people who were born or planted in very ideal circumstances. Wonderful parents, incredible opportunities, a 
abundant blessings. And yet, they've produced very wild or poor fruit, even in the most excellent of growing conditions. And I'm sure that you can think of people who were planted in poor soil that have brought forth poor fruit, and people that were planted in good soil that have brought forth good fruit. So what's the soil principle? And this is truth number six. It doesn't matter what type of soil we're planted in. What matters is how we respond to God's nourishing. So how are you responding to his nourishing? Our final principle comes from Jacob chapter 6. From all that we've studied in Jacob 5, I pray that you've come to a deeper understanding of the character of our Father in heaven and his Son, Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, I can't think of many other places in the scriptures where we really get to know the character and the heart of God. Jacob's commentary in chapter 6 does an excellent job of summing it all up particularly verses 4 and 5. What do these verses reveal about God's character? And how merciful is our God unto us, for he remembereth the house of Israel, both roots and branches, and he stretches forth his hands unto them all the day long. And they are a stiff-necked and a gainsaying people, but as many as will not harden their hearts shall be saved in the kingdom of God. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I beseech of you in words of soberness that ye would repent and come with full purpose of heart and cleave unto God as he cleaveth unto you. And while his arm of mercy is extended towards you in the light of the day, harden not your hearts. What do those verses teach us about the character of God? I love those words. He is a merciful God a remembering God, a stretching forth his hands all the day long God, a laboring God, a saving God, a cleaving God, an extending his arm God. Do you feel like you know your Father in heaven a little better now? I hope so. There we have them. Seven powerful principles of the parable of the olive trees. And there are more, many more that we could have discussed. And now that you've had some practice in interpreting Jacob chapter 5 as a parable, I invite you to go back and study it again by yourself and see how many additional principles that the Spirit can teach you with. it. To take it all to heart, what truth did you most need to hear today? And why? Teachers, you could always edit this slide to only include the principles that you were able to cover in your class. But another question, how have you seen and felt the hand of God working in your life? I am so grateful for the master of the vineyard and the servants. I know that they are working in my life. I see evidence of that every single day. I understand who they are more clearly because of Jacob chapter 5. My immortality and eternal life is of great import to them. I see God's hand in my blessings, and I see God's hand in my challenges. I see God's hand in my repentance, and I see God's hand in my forgiveness. I see his hand in my strengths, and I see his hand in my weaknesses. I bear personal witness that he is laboring, nourishing, digging, grafting, pruning, dunging, burning, grieving, preserving, remembering, stretching, cleaving, and extending his arm in my life. And I can promise you that he's doing the same for you. To what end? Good fruit. I pray that all of us are bringing forth good fruit. Because that does depend on us. Uh, perhaps that's the one area where the metaphor breaks down a little. The trees in this vineyard are not just passive objects responding to the actions of the gardener and nature. 
The trees are active participants in this story with agency and will. We choose how we respond to God's labors. Therefore, as Jacob so succinctly puts it in chapter 6, verse 12, Oh, be wise. What can I say more? So be wise. And may we all enjoy the fruits of our wisdom together with God and Christ and our families in their kingdom during that wonderful season following the heart. Moving on to Jacob chapter 7. Jacob chapter 7 almost feels like an afterthought to Jacob. Seems to me that he first intended chapter 6 to be the end of his writing. He even bids us farewell and ends it with an amen. But a couple of years later, something happens amongst the Nephites that causes Jacob to say, Ah, oh, you know what? I have just got to include this story in the record. The people of the future are really going to need this. We might remember in our last video that Jacob was instructed to only write the things that he felt would be the most relevant to us. Preaching that was sacred. Revelation, which was great. The problems that we examined last week were more societal or general problems. But this last one is directed specifically to members of the church. So after we read this story, you tell me if you think it's relevant to church members. I'll let you decide. And for an object to this lesson, see if you can find a piece of rebar to bring to class. Rebar is short for reinforcing bar. And it's these long pieces of steel that construction crews place inside of concrete to make it far more structurally, architecturally solid and sound. And more than likely, you could just pick some of this up at your local hardware store. But if not, I'll put a link to where you could buy some from Amazon. And a fun idea might be to give each of your students a piece of rebar, small piece of rebar, to take home with them as a reminder of the truths that are taught by this lesson, by this chapter. You can place a piece of it, though, at the front of your class and set it there as a visual aid, but, but you're not going to talk about it until later in the lesson. As an icebreaker to this section, I'd begin by displaying some pictures or videos of earthquake damage, and then ask if anybody had ever actually experienced an earthquake, and to describe what it was like. I've experienced a few small ones in my life. Uh, if you're from the Salt Lake area, you might remember in 2020, there was a, a pretty good, sizable earthquake in the valley. Gave us all a good little shaking. But I can tell you that it's quite terrifying to feel that rumble and that shaking beneath you. Very unsettling. And then I would ask, what makes earthquakes so dangerous? Or how do people typically die in earthquakes? And no, it's not that the earth opens up and swallows people whole, or that they fall into cracks in the earth and get buried. Now, earthquakes are dangerous because things crumble and topple and collapse on top of you in earthquakes. If I were standing in an open field during an earthquake, I probably wouldn't have to worry very much. Might even enjoy the ride. But if you're inside, we're on a city street with buildings all around you. Uh, that's a lot more dreadful and dangerous. To get my students into the scriptures, I'd then ask if they could find the earthquake verse in Jacob chapter 7, somewhere in verses 1 through 6. Can you find it? The answer is verse 5. And he had hope to shake me from the faith. So we've got a different kind of earthquake going on here amongst the Nephites. And this earthquake has a name. It's in verse 1. Let's call this earthquake Sherem. Sherem was a man that had been successful in toppling the faith of many of the Nephites of his time. He's the first Antichrist in the Book of Mormon. There are four major Antichrists in the Book of Mormon. 
Sherem, Nahor, Korahor, and Zorah. And if I were to ask a group of members of the church if they had ever met an Antichrist before, probably not going to be a lot of hands that go up. It just, it just sounds so so terrible. We, we picture cult leaders, tyrants. But really, what is an Antichrist? An Antichrist is any person or organization that seeks to turn you away from Christ and his gospel. So I actually prefer to use a different term for these kinds of people or things. And it comes from Jacob chapter 7. I like to call them faith shakers. Now, if I asked a group of members of the church if they'd ever met a faith shaker before, or if they ever had something happen to them that was a faith shaking experience, every hand goes up. Therefore, do you think this chapter is going to be relevant for our day? Definitely. To liken the scriptures, who or what are some of the faith shakers of our day? I believe that our faith is constantly under attack these days, just within my own lifetime. And I know I'm getting older, but I don't think I'm that old. But faith-shaking influences have become more and more pronounced and widespread. The invention of the internet has given faith-shakers a much louder voice and a bigger soapbox, which gives them an ability to reach anybody, anywhere. And we've never lived in a more skeptical cynical, or secular society than right now. I can only see things getting worse. I know of many in the church who are struggling with their faith or who have even lost it because of these faith-shaking influences out there. Let me be clear about something here. I don't believe that there's a problem in having doubts or questions. It's okay to have doubts or questions. We're meant to experience trials of faith. That's how it grows, how it's how it becomes stronger. So it's not that we have doubts that matters. What matters is what we do with those doubts and questions. How do we approach them when they come? And Jacob is going to help us with that in a minute. There are a lot of faith shakers in our current world. Sometimes they're people, people on social media, celebrities, teachers, college professors, intellectuals, Maybe even family and friends might seek to turn us away from the faith. Perhaps we come across anti-church literature online, or something from church history bothers us, a policy or announcement from church leaders that we find challenging. Trials can shake faith. The unfairness of life, being offended by a church leader or another member. Sometimes the adversary himself can plant doubts and questions in our minds. All of these things can be faith shakers. And many of them share a lot in common with Sharon and the techniques that he used. He's really very deliberate and practiced in his methods, just like many of the faith shakers we find in our world. Uh, Just look at some of the words that are used to describe his method. He used flattering words. He labored diligently. Just like God labors diligently for our salvation in chapter 5, faith shakers also labor diligently but to do just the opposite. Sharon was learned, and he had much power of speech. Oftentimes, faith shakers can be very charismatic, intelligent, and articulate. They often use mocking words, disdain, cynicism, in an effort to make our faith look silly, old-fashioned, or fictitious. You can see these jibes all over Sharon's conversation with Jacob. For example, in verse 6, he says, I have heard and also know that thou goest about much, preaching that which ye call the gospel or the doctrine of Christ. You can almost see him putting air quotes around those terms. In verse 13, he says, Show me a sign by this power of the Holy Ghost in which ye know so much. Well, a possible way to study the story of Sharon with your class is to approach it as a reader's theater. I like to take the story and divide it up into the parts and choose three volunteers from the class to to give a script directly from the scriptures and highlight the words to their part and then invite them to voice act that part. 
those scripts will be available as a handout this week. The three parts I have are the narrator, or Jacob's voice as a narrator, Jacob's voice himself as a character, and Sharon. And those three readers can go back and forth through the story to give your class a good sense of the narrative. I usually set up three chairs at the front and allow them to read. Now, we're not going to read through the entire story here, but I invite you to do so before we go any further. Great story, although it doesn't end very well for Sharon. By the way, some advice to any faith shakers out there. My advice to them would be, don't ever ask for a sign because you might just get one. God almost never uses miracles or signs to create faith, only to confirm it. And if he ever does give a sign to an unbeliever, it's usually for the benefit of those around them and not for the person themselves. Typically, those signs are bad ones, unpleasant ones, ones that you don't want to experience. At the end of our earthquake verse, verse 5, Jacob makes a critical statement. He says, Wherefore, I could not be shaken. That's the point we want to get to. That's our goal. We want to have faith like Jacob's, so that when the faith shakers come, and they will, we will be unshakable and unbreakable. We need to build testimonies that can withstand the earthquakes of doubt and skepticism that surround us without collapsing them. We need to rebar our testimonies. And at that point, I would pull out and display the piece of rebar. How can we earthquake-proof our testimony and reinforce our faith? I invite you to look in the following verses for that answer. Jacob 7, verse 5, Jacob 7, verse 12, Jacob 7, verse 23, a verse from Enos, verse 11, and then go all the way back to Jacob chapter 4, verse 6. So what do we find? Here's how I interpreted these verses. Chapter 7, verse 5. And he had hoped to shake me from the faith, notwithstanding the many revelations and the many things which I had seen concerning these things. For I truly had seen angels, and they had ministered unto me. And also I had heard the voice of the Lord speaking unto me in very word from time to time. Wherefore, I could not be shaken. So, some rebar. Revelation many things which I had seen concerning these things. Uh, Jacob had seen angels. He'd heard the voice of the Lord. I would maybe lump all of those together and say that remembering our previous spiritual experiences can help to make our faith unshakable. Recognize those experiences. To think back on those experiences. And we've all had experience with the Spirit, uh, even if those experiences are small don't always have to be big, miraculous things. Don't forget those experiences, your answered prayers, promptings you felt in your life, times you felt the joy and the goodness of the Spirit, the goodness you felt in gospel settings. Maybe you have experienced a miracle or two. There's the way in which the gospel brings happiness and triumph. Sometimes I'm baffled by the people that will throw all of that away because some stranger on the internet writes something about the church that they don't know how to answer. Don't let that happen. Now, we don't have to ignore those kinds of things and we don't have to be afraid of them. Oftentimes, there are issues that arise that need to be examined and wrestled with, as Jeffrey R. Holland once taught us. Brothers and sisters, this is a divine work in process with the manifestations and blessings of it abounding in every direction. So please don't hyperventilate if from time to time issues arise that need to be examined, understood, and resolved. They do and they will. In this church, what we know will always trump what we do not know. And remember, in this world, everyone is to walk by faith. So please, brothers and sisters, let's not abandon or forget all of these other experiences that we've had with the truth 
because of some of the things that we don't understand. We can let those things serve as a strong foundation for our belief. Chapter 7, verse 12. And this is not all. It has been made manifest unto me, for I have heard and seen, and it also has been made manifest unto me by the power of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, I know if there should be no atonement made, all mankind must be lost. Be sure to have a strong relationship with the Holy Ghost. Keep your life clean and free from serious sin. Be open and responsive to its promptings. Do those things that you know will keep that light of the Spirit on in your life. That's rebar. That will reinforce your faith. 723. And it came to pass that peace and the love of God was restored again among the people, and they searched the scriptures and hearkened no more to the words of this wicked man. It's apparent that after this whole Sharon debacle, that the Nephites under Jacob's leadership got the message. They realized an area in which they had been faltering. They decided to get the scriptures back into their lives, to search them, not just read them, search them, to dig deep, as I like to say. If we wish to earthquake proof our testimonies, scripture study is some of the strongest rebar out there. Is it any wonder why the prophets constantly encourage us to feast daily on them? They help us to stay firm. They have the answers. They have the guidance. They have the strength built right into them. Search them, and that strength will flow from their pages directly into our hearts and minds. Enos 1.11 And after I, Enos, had heard these words, my faith began to be unshaken in the Lord. And I prayed unto him with many long strugglings for my brethren, the Lamerites. Now, I just had to throw this verse in from Enos, Jacob's son, who also uses that phrase, unshaken, in his book. I'm sure he got that language and that idea from his dad. And what is it that helps him to have unshakable faith? It's kind of the, the big principle or one of the big themes of the book of Enos? Prayer. Prayer and receiving answers to prayer will reinforce our testimonies. And then Jacob chapter 4, verse 6. Wherefore, we search the prophets, and we have many revelations in the spirit of prophecy. And having all these witnesses, we obtain a hope, and our faith becometh unshaken insomuch that we truly can command in the name of Jesus and the very trees obey us or the mountains or the waves of the sea. So here in Jacob chapter four, we see our phrase again, our faith becometh unshaken. And here it's the searching of the prophets and their revelations and prophecy that lends the strength. And having all of those witnesses gives us hope. Another source of strength that we get comes from the words of the living prophets and their revelations. We find strength in their witness. We believe in the authority of those that have been called to be special witnesses. So I've never seen God or Jesus Christ, but I believe in the authority of those that say they have. I've never received revelation on behalf of the entire church, but I believe in the authority of those that say they do. And I gain that confidence in them by examining their character, their conviction, the way their words make me feel, and the results that come from following their counsel. And I don't know about you, but when I hear the testimonies and the counsel of men like Russell M. Nelson, Dallin H. Oaks, David A. Bednar, Jeffrey R. Holland, I don't get the sense that they are trying to deceive me, that they're trying to control me, manipulate me. They're sincere. They're humble. They're powerful witnesses of Christ and his gospel. When I follow that counsel, I'm happy and I'm blessed. What greater witness of their divine calling do I need than that? And altogether, I mean, look at our list here. These are simple things, aren't they? Primary answers, we might say. Read your scriptures. Say your prayers. Follow the prophet. But these things, they work. 
I don't believe that there are many people out there who are going to lose their faith if they're sincerely doing these things on a consistent basis. It's when we begin to neglect Scripture study, when our prayers become rote or non-existent, or when we stop listening to the prophets, ignoring their counsel. That's when our faith begins to weaken and crack. So to take it to heart, have any of these things helped you in your own faith-shaking moments? And how? In my life, I too have experienced faith shakers and faith shaking experiences. Sometimes I've heard people out there use the phrase, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt in their testimonies. Now, I'm not criticizing that statement. I think it's wonderful that people can say that. I just don't feel like I can honestly say the same thing. I have faith. I feel I have a very strong testimony. But there are times in my life when doubt casts its shadow in my direction. None of you need to worry about me out there, right? Nothing major. But those moments come. For me, I find that if I immerse myself in some of my favorite chapters of Scripture, Alma 32, Moses 1, Joseph Smith History, Doctrine and Covenants 121, Parables of Jesus, I just if I just sit down and study and dig deep, all of my faith comes flooding back in, chases away those shadows. For me, scriptures have been one of my greatest anchors, some of the greatest rebar for my faith and my testimony. It's a, a great source of earthquake proofing. So my friends out there, as long as we're doing those simple things, I testify that we're going to be strong enough to withstand the sherems, the spiritual earthquakes, the faith shakers of our lives. Remember these reinforcing principles, and we too will be able to say with Jacob, wherefore I could not be shaken. We can become unshakable. And maybe at that point, teachers, if you wanted to hand everybody a little piece of rebar to, to put in their room or next to their bed to remind them to do these simple things, that might be a, a fun idea, a fun way to approach this lesson. And that will conclude our study for this week. Oh, such, such good stuff here in Jacob. Love it. I, I hope that you gained something from this, that you felt the Spirit that uh, you're walking away with stronger faith yourself today. If you feel like this lesson has been helpful to you, or you feel like there's a teacher out there who might benefit from these lessons, uh, I encourage you to share them with those people. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.